Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks. Welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and Super Bowl edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, meteorologist DT, the Colonel of Confusion, the Captain of Catastrophe, the Commander of Chaos. It's Sunday evening, 11 p.m. on February 3rd. Let's talk weather. Now, before we get to the weather itself, we're going to talk about a couple of new things here, the weather alert tables, and also a different way of figuring out how to name and track winter storms without using that pathetically stupid weather channel crap of naming winter storms. So let's take a look at it. If you go to the website here, there's a new tab that you can see up in here. Let me uh, point it out here so you can see it. It's uh, under weather alert table, see that? And then when you go to it, you'll see under weather alert, you'll see this and these and this and this and this. And uh, what, this, what these are, are, let me show you the weather alert tables. When you click on one of them, you'll see this is the U.S. weather alert. This is updated every other day. This is for yesterday's evening, uh, yesterday afternoon, February 2nd. And this covers different events, as you can see in here, February 3rd, to so see these different events. And then, of course, these are the regions of the events, the type of weather, the scale, moderate, significant, major, or historic, uh, the probability, and then the RESIS, which is uh, the Regional Snowstorm Index Scale. We'll talk about that in a second. And Nessus, if it applies, so far it hasn't, and then some additional comments. And then the next one here, this is the uh, overseas one. I do a lot of overseas forecasting, as some of you may know. Uh, a lot of focus right now on South America and the rains and the dry areas in Argentina. A lot of focus on Europe and the snow in the Ukraine and in Russia for their crops. Uh, Australia has just ended. Their harvest has ended there for the wheat crop. And later on, this will be expanded during the, the spring season to cover uh, China and um, uh, the Ukraine and India and the, the whole ball of wax. So you'll see a lot of different overseas forecasts on this as well. So I just want to point that out to you. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that there's another method of figuring out and tracking snowstorms outside of that stupid weather channel crap that they're doing. And that's just so dangerous on so many levels. First of all, it causes confusions because everybody knows we name hurricanes uh, and tropical storms. So a lot of people who are not particularly weather savvy think that there's some sort of significance to naming a winter storm. The problem is that when you do hurricanes, the hurricane center has specific criteria of what a tropical system has to look like in order to get a name, what it has to be to become a hurricane, what it has to become, be, what it has to have in order to reach category one or category three, category five storm. The Weather Channel is just arbitrarily throwing this nonsense out. And, of course, you know, what might be a significant snow in Atlanta, two inches, is not a significant snow in Chicago or New York City or Boston. So that's another complicating factor here. So rather than deal with their crap, which is completely unscientific and, and, and just it's actually the dumbing down of, of, of meteorology, which is, you know, we, we have enough stupid people in the country as it is. We can use this system, which was developed by NOAA, which is actually extremely good. And I don't know if you knew about it, so I'm going to take a minute here and point it out to you. This is called the Regional Snowstorm Index, or RSI. And uh, it's based upon, and you can read about it here on the website. Just Google search it. You'll find it. And um, the, there's a, it's based upon the eight different climate regions of the country and their uh, threshold for significant snow and their, re and their history of significant snow. So again, Category 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And again, the RSI val values of the storm and then which ones falls as notable significant major crippling or extreme so these are the regions you can see the eight regions most of the rsi appears to be used uh, east of the rockies but i have seen it and i am, will be using it west of the rockies and uh, you can see there's different regions here very nicely now it's similar to the nessus which is the northeast snowstorm index scale which some of you may be familiar with the problem is that that only applies to the northeast so this is, applies to everybody throughout the country and it's based upon population and the amount of population affected, affected by it so give, give, let me give you an example this is the rsi event for back in 1973 february 9th through 11th now this was a major snowstorm for the southeast notice if you would which is going to be kind of funny richmond did get much, got screwed out of the southeast snowstorm and the northeast snowstorms, but that's Richmond for you. Nalfa got more snow than Richmond again. And uh, this ended up producing significant snow, as you can see from the scales here, across uh, much of the uh, deep south. Now, this which event would not show up at all on the Nessus scale or the Coast and Uchilini snowstorm book, but it was a major event for the southeast. So that's one of the advantages of using the rest of scale, the RSI. Okay. And uh, the other point here is that they, they have different criteria thresholds. Like the threshold number one for the south is two inches of snow. You see this here? There we go. And then five inches and 10 inches and 15 inches. But for the northeast, it's four 
10, 20, and 30 inches of snow. And then for the West Coast, it's 4, 10, 20, and 30, and so on and so forth. So all these different regions, uh, and that's the criteria for it. And remember, this is the base population in here for the Central, uh, for the Northeast, you know, 60 million now uh, as of this time. And this is the area. So how much of the area is affected over the population and, and the amount of snow determines how it gets placed. So anyway, I think it's a pretty good scale. All right, let's talk weather. This is the European model here from uh, this afternoon, the 12Z run, and uh, we've got a couple of features here to talk about. There's a system down in here, another one here, and this big west coast low up in the Gulf of Alaska is dropping down here. We can see that in the next slide here. They develop a phase right here very nicely. You can see the phasing occurring right like here, and this has moved into the Great Plains in the Midwest. And... What does this look like on the service map? Well, we have a big rainstorm on the east coast. The uh, rain snow line is way to the north, way up in here, because the uh, cold pattern is breaking down. We can see there's a big high up here, but that's way up to the north. Well, this is even rain in Pennsylvania. I mean, everybody, even in, probably into New England, got strong southeast winds like this. And then look at the cold air coming into the west coast. So, And this is you know, day six here. Now we see the big storm. Uh, right here, you can see it's now off New England. Again, this might be a snowstorm from northern New England. And look at this big, giant low over the Great Basin. And this is what it looks like here. We can see the um, big low. See that low right there? Again, that could boost significant snow here for uh, interior New England. And then look at the cold air coming into the south. We have a bit, another low in Colorado developing very nicely. And this here is the uh, what a map looks like at uh, day 8. And that low, which was, you know, which came down... Uh, from here, now here, is now here. See what it does? Like this. And it's pulling up these strong south winds and warm temperatures. Big snowstorm for the upper plains, the upper Midwest. And we can see that very nicely here. Look at that. That's a big snowstorm for Iowa, the upper plains, and the western Corn Belt. And they need the snow quite nicely, right? really badly in those areas for the drought. A good snowstorm there would help a lot because it would melt slowly over time and get into the soil moisture. Meanwhile, look how warm it is here up in this whole area, up in this way, the southeast winds. So it's going to get warm. We've got rain coming in next week, no doubt on the east coast here. So be prepared for that. And then uh, finally, day 10, the European has a bit of a trough, as you can see very nicely. See that right here? And we're getting some sort of ridging trying to form here in the big southeast ridge. And it's not a very impressive-looking pattern, not a very cold pattern yet. But I'm not willing to say the winter is over like some. I've read some other folks talking about that. So uh, let's see why. This is the day 10 service map, and again, it's a very uh, mild, wet, wet map. The front stalls right here, a lot of rain up in this area here. Here's the next strong cold front coming south, but look how mild it is for most of the country over the plains of the Midwest. Not very cold at all. Now, this is the day 10 um, European map here. We can uh, zoom in a little bit and see what it looks like a little bit. And we can see, um, I'll point out some features here. I'll change colors here. There we go. And the vortex is still up in here. We have a bit of a trough here. The southeast ridge is leaving. And they're trying to get some sort of ridge. You can see the little high there. He's trying to push and get a ridge developing on the west coast. So it's not a very cold pattern, but it's certainly not a mild one. And uh, this is what it looks like day 10, a little closer. And again, you can see a little bit of ridging trying to develop here. Right in this area right here. See that? We're trying to get some ridging forming there. but And then there's a new cold front in here. And this is now this is the GFS here at the uh, I think this is yeah for February 13th you can see it right here see that February 13th and what we have is a very nice ridge which has developed right here and then a pretty big trough over the Midwest and the East Coast that's day 10 for the uh, February 13th and if we go on this is February uh, 16th and again big trough on the West Coast this is trying to develop a PNA this is trying you can see this is trying to pull down some really cold air into the country again. It's trying to. Now, typically, the European ensembles do better than the GFS, or certainly the uh, ensemble uh, GFS barely does as close as the operationally European. But over the last few months, that has not quite been the case, and I'll show you why. Now, this is one of these things that uh, the folks at EMC, Environmental Modeling Center, keeps track of. It shows you the quality, the performance scores of the, of the various models. Let me point something out here. Remember back in December when the GFS was, con the, the European, excuse me, was constantly forecasting all these Arctic outbreaks to develop here over the Midwest and the Northeast. And of course, it never happened. And what that did was, look how badly it performed. Now, this here is uh, North America. 
Let me highlight this. This is the northern hemisphere here, and this is North America. But back in December, look how low those scores were. Okay, uh, this is the uh, snowstorm in the northeast the European got early on, back in the early November after Sandy, and then another drop, and uh, finally Euro the Europeans begin to catch up here. But again, notice that the uh, GFS ensemble mean, see this, the ensemble mean is doing the per the the blue here is doing pretty good, almost as good as the European. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. So it's possible that the uh, GFS might be correct here. Possible. If we look at the different teleconnections indices, we don't see a lot of difference here. This is the uh, EPO, Eastern Pacific Oscillation, here. And it's very close to neutral right in here. And remember, what you want to get is a negative EPO, which helps, lead, which leads to a positive PNA. But as you can see, everything's neutral. It gets a little negative towards the end, but nothing too, nothing too exciting. And this is the P, this is the PNA pattern. Again, pretty flat. Not much going on there. Here is the Arctic oscillation. Again, very minor variations here. Not a whole lot of movement. And this is the NAO, which is slightly, it's running slightly positive. Oh, close to neutral, but generally positive. So nothing very impressive yet at all here. So it looks like a pretty blah pattern, and that's one of the reasons why February is going to turn warm here after like, February 5th or 6th into probably the 10th or 12th of the month. If you look at the MJO here, now this takes us February 1st, we can see where the MJO is right here. Let me highlight it right there. See it? It's in phase 8. And uh, the forecast models, as you can see, this is the European takes it down to, as you can see here, then all the way to phase 3 by February 16th. That's a little fast, I think. And then um, this is the European weeklies, and it has in phase three by early March, which would be a fairly mild beginning to spring, a pretty good uh, early spring there. And this would be the GFS ensembles, which does a loop-de-loop, -loop, the only model which does that, of course, has got to be the GFS here in phase eight. And then by mid-February, it's still in phase one. And to remind you what that looks like, this is the pattern here for uh, February in phase eight. And um, this is uh, definitely phase eight in here. And we can see big blocking up in here, big low in this area. So that definitely favors the snowstorm pattern. The problem is we don't have the blocking right now. And that's one of the things that's hurting us. And this is the Fed pattern here for uh, phase uh, one in February. And then finally, if we go into phase two in March, it's right over in this area here. So finally, if we go to the CFS. Uh, we can see how warm it is here for the 6 to 10 day and the 8 to 14 day. But it does turn somewhat cold here in week three and week four. And for precipitation, we see a little bit of precipitation on the East Coast and the Midwest and the East Coast in week three and week four. So for those reasons, not willing to kill off the entire winter just yet. I still think we have some possibilities here. Well, we'll see what happens and how long the warm period lasts and whether or not we go cold by the middle of the month. If we haven't gotten cold by the middle of the month, then you probably could put a fork in the, in the uh, winter and bring on an early spring. This is Meteorologist DT from WeatherWisk.com. I'll talk to you soon.